Um, so I'm Michelle Pistone, I'm a professor of law here at Villanova, and I direct a clinic called CARES, the Clinic for Asylum, Refugee, and Immigrant Services. We, uh, my students and I work collaboratively on cases representing refugees who fled persecution. Right now, we're representing an unaccompanied minor from Honduras. And we are so fortunate because Juan and Gracie uh, Murphy, who you'll hear from at lunch, both provided expert testimony in that case, and we hope to get um, a resolution of it soon. But I'm here to, um, to introduce the panelists on this panel, which is thinking about Catholic social teaching and what it tells us about migration and the issues that we're talking about today. We're really, really fortunate to have um, two speakers here who are expert on the, in the field. To my, my immediate left is one of my favorite colleagues at Villanova, uh, Professor Catherine Wilson. She's an associate professor and interim, um, chair, interim chair for the Department of Public Administration. So of all the issues that um, public administration looks at, she decided to focus on immigration. And it's really um, wonderful that she's focusing so much of her energy and attention on immigration and the, the um, administrative system that kind of deals with it. So we're really fortunate to hear from her. And then next we'll hear from um, Father Bruce Lewandowski, who's the vicar for multicultural affairs for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. So he has been working with the Latino community um, in the Archdiocese uh, for many years. The thing that's most interesting, I think, about his background is that when he was in the seminary, he needed to learn Spanish and give um, a, a sermon in Spanish and, um, and learned it and then decided to go and to continue to, um, to practice his Spanish. And so it's wonderful that he used that as an opportunity to connect to this important community within the Catholic Church here in the United States. And just one um, note that at the end of, of this session, we have students in the audience who are gonna be handing out letters with talking points. We want everyone to follow the advice that we heard from, um, from Juan Sheehan about talking to our congressmen and our senators about these important issues. So students from Villanova are here to help you do that and we have talking points from CRS that we can give you to send letters to your congressmen and senators. So um, with that, let me just turn it over to Kat. Who wants to go first? Father Bruce is gonna go first. I'm very happy to be with you here this morning. Our lives, um, in our lives, um, we're offered many choices. And when it um, comes to making choices, our choices uh, as Catholic Christians are always informed by our faith. And so, in talking about um, the issues that we're going to present this morning, um, it's always faith in Jesus and his teachings and the uh, gospel of love that inform our decisions. And so we're offered choices whether we should welcome or marginalize, uh, whether we should include or exclude, or whether we should uh, unite or separate. Uh, those words are important when we're talking about migration and the spirituality or a theology of migration. Uh, again, whether we want to welcome or not or shun, to unite or separate, to include or exclude. Continuing a long tradition of solidarity, uh, which is articulated in Catholic social teaching over the past decades by the US Catholic bishops, they have offered us a faith-based understanding of immigration and immigration reform. They prioritize people over profits, human costs over financial costs, development and dignity over destruction and divisive rhetoric that can degrade and dehumanize. And so in January of 2004, the Catholic Bishops Conference published Strangers No Longer, 
together on a journey of hope. And in that document, they say, our continent has consistently received immigrants, refugees, exiles, and the persecuted from other lands, fleeing injustice and oppression, and seeking liberty and the opportunity to achieve a full life. Many have found work, home, security, liberty, and growth for themselves and their families. Our countries share this immigrant experience, referring to Mexico, though with different expressions and different degrees. And so, in their efforts to safeguard the dignity of all people, the bishops of the United States have consistently argued that the moral health of our nation and the moral health of our economy is measured not in terms of financial matters, um, like the gross national product or stock prices, but in terms of how the economy affects the quality of life of the community as a whole, at people, where people are living. And so they note that an ordered economy must be shaped by three questions. How does the economy um, affect the people? So what does the economy do for the people? What does it do to people? And how do people participate in it? It puts strong emphasis on what impact the economy has on the poor. And it stresses that the economy is made for human beings, not human beings for the economy. And in the immigration debate, this means that the primary focus has to do first with human and relational cost. Catholic social teaching asks us to think, what does our immigration policy do for people? What does it do to people? And how do people participate in it? Catholic social teaching asks us to what extent the economy of our country enhances the dignity of every human person. How does immigration law affect the dignity of every human person, especially those most vulnerable or deemed insignificant? And so I want to quote from Economic Justice for All. Everything necessary for leading a life truly human, such as food, clothing, and shelter, the right to choose a state of life freely, and to found a family, the right to education, to employment, to a good reputation, to respect, to appropriate information, to activity in accord with the upright norm of one's own conscience, to protection of privacy and rightful freedom, even in matters religious. That we all have, have rights. Uh, in ec economic justice for all, um, published by the Bishop's Conference, we get a list of those rights. And um, John the 23rd in Pacham and Terrace said that it is preferable, preferable for people to meet such needs in their homeland, that they should find all of these things where they live. But when these conditions cannot be met there, uh, Pope John the 23rd said, people have a right to emigrate in order to more fittingly provide a future for themselves and for their family. And so many are forced to move, move across borders to connect to jobs, to education, to health care, and so many other things that they have a right to. Further, in Strangers No Longer, we read Catholic teaching has a long and rich tradition in defending the right to migrate based on the life and teaching of Jesus. The church's teaching has provided the basis for the development of basic principles regarding the right to move across borders. Catholic teaching also states that the root causes of migration, poverty, injustice, religious intolerance, armed conflicts must be addressed so that migrants can remain in their homeland and support their families. And so what we hear from the Catholic bishops is that um, there are factors called push factors that make people move. It's preferable that people find what they need and have a right to in their own country, but when they cannot find it, there is a right to migrate. In their pastoral letter called Instruction for the Pastoral Care of People Who Migrate, the bishops have said that any limitation on internal migration must be undertaken only after careful consideration on the demands of international solidarity. These considerations include development, trade and investment programs, education and training, 
and even distribution policies designed to narrow the wide gaps between the rich and the poor. In, in other words, what we're saying is um, countries have a right to control their borders, but international solidarity should take into consideration um, to what extent and consider the human cost. Otherwise, we end up looking at immigration as a problem itself, isolated from push factors, war, poverty, discrimination, and persecution, which are key push factors. We end up looking at immigration as a problem to be solved rather than a symptom of a deeper social imbalance, um, not just in our region, but throughout the world. And so, when people cross borders without documentation, most are not simply breaking civil laws. Um, they're, according to our Catholic social teaching, they're obeying a natural law, a natural human law, that they have a right to basic um, services, to have their basic needs met. And such is the need to find work, to feed their families, to attain a dignified, a more dignified life or style of living. So crossing international borders without papers is, in most countries, an administrative infraction. It's not a crime. It's not a violation of divine law or natural law. In such cases, undocumented persons who are migrating should in no way be confused with serious criminals who are a threat to national security. Such misunderstandings and injustice occur when immigrants and immigration are perceived primarily as problems in themselves, rather than as symptoms of serious systemic problems, social ills, and inequality. And so, concerning migration, we have to ask ourselves, um, looking at um, Paul's letter to the Philippians, um, Paul describes Christians as living in this world but carrying a passport to another world. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews speaks of a journey of hope toward different places, a journey that we experience here on earth, and one day a journey that will lead us to heaven. We have no lasting home here on earth. And as we hear recounted over and over in the sacred scriptures and in our own day and age, people are on the move in search of a home here on earth that meets their needs in a more than satisfactory way until they reach their homeland in heaven. I think Matthew 25 um, provides probably the most basic perspective on a theology of migration and no text probably speaks more eloquently. It describes the social dislocation of people, people who are hungry in their homelands, thirsty in their deserts as they attempt to cross, naked after being robbed of their possessions, imprisoned in detention centers, sick in hospitals. And if they make it to their destination, they are offered uh, estrangement, they're shunned, they're not welcome, they're marginalized. And so this text implies that crossing borders makes possible new relationships and it puts the verdict of judgment to a great extent on us and the choices that we make. Uh, whether we will welcome or marginalize, whether we include or exclude, whether we divide or separate. To conclude, um, when we consider a theology of migration, we should consider what Jesus teaches about the limits of compassion. That compassion should know no borders. That under God we are all one family. And if anyone is it an, is an alien, it's he or she who has alienated him or herself from a brother or a sister. The term alien is not to be used for all, I think, for all undocumented immigrants. It should be those used for those who estrange 
exclude and divide, who separate themselves from their own brothers and sisters, denying that we are one family and the great family of God. to follow. Um, first of all, thanks to the conference organizers for putting on this important event, and I want to thank Father Bruce for his insightful comments on the theology of migration and the human dimension that all of us need to consider when we are trying to tackle this, this issue. What I'd like to do is spend the remainder of the time looking at the actual practice of what nonprofit providers have termed immigrant accompaniment in the aftermath of the numbers of unaccompanied minors whose numbers increased dramatically last year. Just to kind of lay out a couple of different ideas about what accompaniment means, it could involve education and awareness of the issue at hand, direct action, so recommendations for those um, helping those directly involved. Sometimes it literally involves walking with these vulnerable individuals and families to appointments and literally through the immigration process itself. And finally, advocacy calling upon government leaders at the state, local, and federal levels, and I include all three because I think sometimes our focus tends to be fixed on the federal levels. Local and state are equally as important, so I think we really need to understand that, to set aside emergency funding and provide legal refuge for these minors. So the other side of unaccompanied minors is in fact accompaniment. Um, and just to give you my general definition of what that means is walking with a person or a community in their specific journey towards a particular destination, all the while taking stock of their individual and collective needs. So what is the Catholic Church's position on accompaniment regarding this specific issue? Um, I'd like to refer to some materials that have been published by the United States uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB. First, um, this all, these all came out last year, July of 2014, the USCCB assembled an advocacy toolkit, which included a letter from Pope Francis to the Mexican government on the World Day of Migrants and Refugees on July 14, 2014. Suggestions for capacity building by the United States and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Documents that provide context to the issue of unaccompanied minors in light of Catholic social teaching, which Father Bruce just so eloquently covered. The toolkit provides important statistics, I think, for all of us regarding refugee youth around the world. According to the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, 50% of global refugees are children, and 2-4% to of these refugees are unaccompanied youth. Also, the UNHCR reports that apart from Mexico and Central America, other areas of the world are experiencing high levels of unaccompanied minors, most specifically Syria, a place that possibly has the largest amount of unaccompanied minors today. Second, the, U the USCCB published a resource kit to educate the faithful on this issue. This included a webinar on important drivers, those push factors of migration by immigrant children and their families to the United States. The webinar was a joint collaboration among the USCCB, Catholic Charities, Catholic Relief Services, and the Catholic Legal Immigration Network. And third, the USCCB put together a publication entitled Hospitality and Accompaniment for Immigrant Families, which urged the faithful to consider a few types of hospitality, short term, donating items for immediate needs, for these vulnerable children and families, and longer term, hosting children and families, which would include providing shelter, transportation, assistance with health care, helping them enroll in the school system, walking through immigration proceedings, as well as financial support, and in-kind donations. This is what we call accompaniment, right, in the fullest sense. Where have individuals who are interested in helping these populations turned? Again, from the USCCB materials, regional Catholic charities organizations have provided information on how to donate one's time and assistance, especially for those living near the border and those affected areas. Those interested in hosting families, the USCCB set up an email to help encourage families to host unaccompanied minors and their families and to also conduct 
an environmental scan, so an assessment in their particular area that families, those families will most likely need. Where are food banks located? <clears throat> Where can these individuals get federal assistance, like WIC? Healthcare, pastoral counseling and care. Um, what organizations are in the areas that those host families live where they can find community organizations providing holistic services. And then finally, migration and refugee services under the USCCB in concert with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of State provides 12 licensed unaccompanied refugee minor foster care programs for those who are interested. And these are separate from the domestic programs that are run in the United States and they've been developed by leaders in the field of immigrant children. So what has been done since this has been put forth? In um, the Catholic News Service report of July 2014, Patricia Zapper relates a few responses by the Catholic community. At the parish level, Sacred Heart Parish in McAllen, Texas coordinated with local food banks to help provide relief. At the diocesan level, the Diocese of Brownsville, Texas encourage parishioners to support immigrant families with short-term assistance after families were released um, after de deportation proceedings. And at the organizational level, Catholic Charities established a website for donations to support relief services. The question then remains, what can all of us do at our individual levels? And I think this is a question that the remainder of the conference will address, and I know that there's time set aside at the end, but I would just encourage all of us to re-examine key tenets of Catholic social teaching. First, the commitment to the poor, vulnerable, and at-risk populations, what Catholic social teaching calls the preferential option for the poor, um, a concern for protecting and advancing the dignity of the human person, which Father Bruce just talked about, having a relational dimension to this issue, and finally, understanding the biblical mandate, as he also articulated, of welcoming the stranger. Pope Francis, in his papal letter for the Mexican government on unaccompanied migrant children on the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, July 14, 2014, talked about the need to understand the inherent complexity of the issue at hand and to respond in a multi-pronged fashion. Let's hear what he has to say. This humanitarian emergency requires, as a first urgent measure, these children be welcomed and protected. These measures, however, will not be sufficient unless they are accompanied by policies that inform people about the dangers of such a journey, and above all, that promote development in their countries of origin. Finally, this challenge demands the attention of the entire international community so that new forms of legal and secure migration may be adopted. So what are some structural areas that need additional strengthening? According to the USCCB and their capacity building report, first, to have a, or obtain official refugee status for unaccompanied minors and families through in-country assessments. Second, to improve screening efforts for human trafficking for these children and families in collaboration with the Department of State the UN, HCR, and other agencies. And three, to increase funding by the Department of State to the UN, HCR, and other nonprofit groups directly involved in protecting these vulnerable individuals. Let me end on some positive notes. What has been taking place in the United States? How has the practice of accompaniment been realized? First, regarding the need for increased protection and refugee status, in September 2014, the Obama administration permitted refugee processing centers in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And more information, if you want more information on this, you can find this on the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service website. Regarding the need for human trafficking screening, a report in the Austin Chronicle, April 3rd, 2015, by Dina Samir Shahada, shows that still more work needs to be done in this arena. She argues that grassroots organizations realize that screening is one of the most important issues. The other one is getting children adequate legal representation, which is not consistent in all the affected areas in the United States. Add to this the ongoing importance of professional translation and interpretation for children to make sure that screening is thorough. 
And finally, the need for greater understanding by law enforcement officials of key tenets of the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008 for effective screening. Regarding the need for increased funding, an editorial on the Monitor from McAllen, Texas, just yesterday, reported that federal funding will be made available to help border areas that assisted in humanitarian efforts regarding unaccompanied minors and their families. Essentially, those agencies, local government, and nonprofit organizations may now apply to FEMA funds to reimburse their efforts. So I think, you know, if you look at what's taking place, again, I think on the human trafficking side, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But with respect to refugee status and also to funding and sources of funding, there has been some forward movement. I believe um, that all of this takes into consideration the understanding of accompaniment, as stated above, walking with a person or a community in their specific journey towards a particular destination, all the while taking stock of their individual and collective needs. Thank you very much. So we're right up against noon, and that's when we're supposed to break for lunch, but let me just see if there's, um, maybe we have time for like two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Mother Bruce, you were talking about the resolution of the push factors is critical so that people can stay home, you know, and I, I think that is critical. But that's, if you listen to the first presentation this morning, which you perhaps weren't even here for, but Juan talked about the 70,000 narco traffickers. And how do we resolve that push factor? You know, nobody wants another war. Nobody wants to send the SEALs down there. We could send the SEALs or we could send 500 Jesuits. Maybe they're the same. <laughs> but, but this is where life gets messy. We don't mind talking about ex, you know, economic exploitation. American companies shouldn't do these bad things. But the real reason people are saying they're leaving primarily is threat of death. And so how do we resolve that? 70,000, how do you take that on? That's pretty tough. I, I think there's, well, pray <laughs> is the first answer. Yeah, well, I shouldn't take that, <laughs> shouldn't take that lightly, but, but that's the truth. The, the other is the willingness of the US government to take on initiatives that, um, grassroots initiatives that promote uh, healthy family life. And, and by that, we mean all of the basic needs of the family are met. Food, clothing, shelter, meaningful work, uh, and you know, not just um, th those, but th then beyond, um, so that people can take part in society in a meaningful, helpful way for themselves and, and each other. So the um, policies in the, in the maybe the last 10 years of US government of moving more toward isolation, uh, of not getting involved in other countries, of not um, promoting and supporting the economies of other countries, of not supporting these grassroots programs um, in other countries. It's really at the level of our involvement throughout the world and governmental decisions um, and how those, those play out for the, the good of people in other countries. That we live well in our own country should mean that other people live well in theirs. And our government is not always concerned about achieving that goal. Um, on the level of the Catholic Church, though, I think that's where we see significant movement, growth, positive change. That the Catholic Church is very much involved through Catholic Religious Services and so many other religious organizations, religious communities, associations, and institutes in um, promoting, supporting these grassroots initiatives that provide you know, for families that families can live well where they are and don't have to move. Uh, to answer your question in, in a very quick <laughs> way, it would be impossible, but those are some ideas anyway. There is a right to migrate, yes. There is a right to migrate, and as Catholics, we understand that at the most basic level, from the incarnation, God migrated from heaven to earth, and that's when it started. 
and, and so that's when the theology and spirituality of migration began, when Jesus became flesh. We have to be careful about that because on the other side of the right to migrate is the right of a country to protect its borders. But compassion always has to be the, the, the measure. What, what's the compassionate, loving response in that? And I have to be honest, that's not always a question when you're making government policy. The government policy doesn't look as compassionate. And unfortunately, that each one of us is the image and likeness of God from our, our, the beginning of our existence is not taken into consideration. And that's where we need to ground our conversation when we're talking about migrants. In a conversation that each one of us is, is born in the image and likeness of God, and that colors the rest of the conversation so that compassion, the loving response, can be part of, of crafting policy. So the government gets a pass when it comes to its own board. I'm um, uh, sorry. It's a pass on the, on the rights of well, I'll open up if anybody else wants to respond because it's some people sit on the edge of their seats. But <laughs> I, I think the, the dynamic tension between the right to migrate and the right of a country to protect its borders has to, that conversation has to happen with love and compassion and deep understanding of things that we've already talked about and things I'm sure that Juan mentioned. But I, I, I think basing a conversation from a religious perspective in the incarnation, okay, that God migrated in the, the fact that each one of us is created in the image and likeness of God and the Jesus commandment to love, um, certainly that conversation between the country defending its borders and the individual who wants to migrate, um, will, things will turn out differently. Is that conversation taking place today on the political level? No. The bishops are, are, have been very much involved in, in pushing that, though. The Catholic bishops. I, I would make a plug, though, for, again, when we talk about political, the different levels there, the federal, state, and local, I would argue, following different groups at the local level here in Philadelphia, that there's a lot of movement at the local level in terms of the impact that I think advocacy groups and grassroots organizations are making in terms of changing policy. And I do think that these, these municipal decisions are gonna have larger ramifications upstream, right? So you're actually seeing a lot of municipalities that are changing different policies and procedures based on some of these concerns. Some of them may be faith-based, some may be advocacy-related, but there's clearly a larger conversation taking place among the groups. And I would, I would um, encourage people to kind of look at what's happening at the local level. So, so um, I want to thank the panelists.